Good morning. Ah, I think I'm live now. Well, it is a pleasure to be here this morning. For those that may not have caught it from Clay's introduction, my name's Blake. I'm one of the interns here at Grace Warman, and I'm truly thankful for the opportunity to lead us through the gospel this morning. And the reason why, it's nothing about me, but it's a chance that we can come together here and gather and worship together. And I hope that as in the last song that we sang in the opening package this morning, it would be a chance that we can lift the name of Jesus above any other name that has ever been in history or ever will be. So thank you for this chance. For those of us who are in the crowd there and you're regularly joining us this morning, you know that one of the things we love to do is to preach and teach through the scriptures. And we usually do this by preaching through a book at a time, chapter by chapter and verse by verse. We usually uh, do this because the Bible is God's word given to us. It reveals to us who God is, who we are, and it helps us understand that life isn't about you and it's not about me. The Bible reminds us that everything that exists was made to point us toward Jesus, our creator and our redeemer. And it's only in knowing who Jesus is and what he's done for us in this amazing story of redemption that we can ultimately know who we are and how we were made to live in light of that good news. So this morning, we'll be continuing our journey in Luke chapter 7. I encourage you, you can take out your Bibles and open it up to that book of the Bible and chapter. And if you do have your hard copy with you, you'll find Luke about three-quarter way through the book. So as you turn there, I'll open up our time in prayer, and then we'll read together as the scripture is read out, and you can see it playing on the screen behind me. So please join with me as we pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you for who you are, for your nature, and for your character. And in your scriptures, we see that you are one who is both fully God and fully man. And we see that this is such an amazing truth of Scripture. We see that you are one whose words have authority. We read in the Scriptures that by the breath of your mouth, the heavens were made. And so we see that you have authority both over the physical world and the spiritual realm. And let us contemplate that and what that means in our lives as we come before you this morning and be reminded of the good news of the gospel. And so, Lord, for myself, my prayer is that the the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart may be pleasing in your sight as we go through this passage. Amen. Reading from Luke chapter 7, verses 18 through 35. The disciples of John reported all these things to him. And John, calling two of his disciples to him, sent them to the Lord, saying, Are you the one who is to come, or shall we look for another? And when the men had come to him, they said, John the Baptist has sent us to you, saying, Are you the one who is to come, or shall we look for another? In that hour he healed many people of diseases and plagues and evil spirits, and on many who were blind he bestowed sight. And he answered them, Go, and tell John what you have seen and heard. The blind receive their sight, the lame walk, Lepers are cleansed and the deaf hear. The dead are raised up. The poor have good news preached to them. And blessed is the one who is not offended by me. When John's messengers had gone, Jesus began to speak to the crowds concerning John. What did you go out into the wilderness to see? A reed shaken by the wind? What then did you go out to see? A man dressed in soft clothing? Behold, those who are dressed in splendid clothing and live in luxury are in king's courts. What then did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes, I tell you, and more than a prophet, this is he of whom it is written. Behold, I send my messenger before your face, who will prepare your way before you. I tell you, among those born of women, none is greater than John. Yet the one who is least in the kingdom of God is greater than he. When all the people heard this, and the tax collectors too, they declared God just, having been baptized with the baptism of John. But the Pharisees and the lawyers rejected the purpose of God for themselves, not having been baptized by him. To what then shall I compare the people of this generation, and what are they like? 
They are like children sitting in the marketplace and calling to one another, we played the flute for you and you did not dance. We sang a dirge and you did not weep. For John the Baptist has come eating no bread and drinking no wine and you say, he has a demon. The son of man has come eating and drinking and you say, look at him, a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. Yet wisdom is justified by all her children. So before we dive into this morning's text, let's just recap on some of the events leading up to this passage earlier in Luke chapter 7. You'll notice that one of the themes that Luke is trying to establish in this book so far is that Jesus is no ordinary man. He is both fully God and fully man. Jesus is the one who has authority. We continue to see this theme being developed through chapter 7 and the rest of the book, and you'll be able to look forward to that as we continue on in this book. But this chapter, it starts with the story of the healing of the centurion's servant. We see this centurion had a profound understanding of grace and of his position before Jesus. He understood Jesus' authority and the power of his word. And despite the Jewish elders appealing to Jesus to heal the centurion's servant because they said he is worthy to have you do this for them, the centurion understood that he was helpless on his own power to heal his servant. And he even acknowledged that he isn't even worthy to have Jesus come under his roof. So continuing on this theme with Jesus' authority, we see Jesus then raising the widow's son to life. By the power of Jesus' words, this man who was dead, so no beating heart, no brain activity, no air pumping through his lungs, he instantly sits up and begins to speak. And the great crowd who is with Jesus naturally react with both fear and awe. They glorify God, and the news of what Jesus had done spreads throughout the whole region of Judea and the surrounding country. So if you'll dive into the scriptures with me, I'll read the opening verses, verses 18 through 20. The disciples of John reported all these things to him, and John, calling two of his disciples to him, sent them to the Lord, saying, Are you the one who is to come, or shall we look for another? And when the men had come to him, they said, John the Baptist has sent us to you, saying, Are you the one who is to come, or shall we look for another? So this is where we're picking up the chapter this morning. The disciples of John the Baptist had heard about these miraculous events, and they bring this word back to John. So the important question that you should ask yourself is, where is John at this time? Where are the disciples bringing this news back? And so to answer this question, we have to go all the way back to Luke chapter 3. And I know it's been quite a while since we've been in that chapter, and maybe you're like me and you've forgotten exactly the, the sequence of events, or maybe you're new joining us here at our gatherings at Grace Warman. And incidentally, if that's the case, I would encourage you, as Clay mentioned in the opening announcements, check out our website, gracesass.com. You can be caught up on the previous sermons if you want to catch up to where we are in this passage. But incidentally, Luke chapter 3 tells us that John's currently in prison. You see, he's been held by King Herod for speaking out against the king's actions that took his brother Philip's wife. So we find John in the depths of this dark and damp prison that he's hearing about Jesus' recent actions. But you can imagine John, he's been working tirelessly in proclaiming the coming Messiah, and he might begin to have doubts as he's sitting in this prison. Was all my work for nothing? Seems like this is costing me a lot. Has it been worth it? He wants to know if Jesus is the coming Messiah he was proclaiming. So he sent his disciples out to Jesus to ask him, are you the one who is to come or shall we be looking for another? And if you'll pause with me for a minute from this story, this brings up a really interesting question that we might also ask of ourselves. Who are we looking to? Are we looking to Jesus or are we looking to some other savior in our lives? You see, all of us are looking for a sense of security or control in our lives, a, a sort of functional savior. Some of us might find our security in our jobs or in our status, in our relationships or our wealth. 
But the reality is that these sources are all fleeting. Despite the fact that these seem to all provide an illusion of security, we know that in an instant it can all change. So when we are looking for that Savior in our lives, let us look to Jesus, to the one who does not change. Scripture says that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. And let us find our ultimate joy in this true Savior rather than the ones we try to cling to. Jesus then acts in response to this question that he's heard from John's disciples. So if you'll turn to your scriptures in verses 21 through 23, we read, In that hour he healed many people of diseases and plagues and evil spirits, and on many who were blind he bestowed sight. And he answered them, Go and tell John what you've seen and heard. The blind receive sight, the lame walk, Lepers are cleansed, and the deaf hear. The dead are raised up. The poor have good news preached to them. And blessed is the one who is not offended by me. So I really want us to see the beauty in how Jesus responds to this question. You know, at first we might think that Jesus would respond in a condemning way to this question. Come on, John, why, why would you have doubts about me and my character? But we see Jesus takes a very different approach, doesn't he? He offers the hearers a model of what they can do when faced with doubts about Jesus. You see, when faced with doubts about Jesus' character and his authority over this world, Jesus says, look to me. Look at my actions and what the scriptures testify about me. Immediately, Jesus offers concrete evidence of his authority and power. The text says, in that very hour, he healed many people of diseases and plagues and evil spirits. Did you catch that? Jesus' power was displayed immediately. It's not as if it's something he had to conjure up with some phenomenal sort of effort. And after showing this physical evidence, he then points the people to the scriptures to see what was prophesied about this coming Messiah. So reading now from verses 22 and 23, he answered them, Go and tell John what you have seen and heard. The blind receive their sight, the lame walk, lepers are cleansed, and the deaf hear. The dead are raised up, and the poor have good news preached to them, and blessed is the one who is not offended by me. We see that the words that were written about the kind Messiah were directly fulfilled in the life of Jesus. And this is such an important truth of Scripture that can't be overstated that the words that are written about Jesus either have already come to pass or one day will. And praise God that we can rest in this truth. While Jesus' words do not appear to be a direct quote, he seems to be drawing inspiration from Isaiah chapter 35. And as a reminder, Isaiah was an Old Testament prophet who lived hundreds of years before Jesus was speaking these words. And in Isaiah chapter 35, we read, Say to those who have an anxious heart, be strong, fear not. Behold, your God will come with vengeance. With the recompense of God, he will come and save you. Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened and the ears of the deaf unstopped. Then shall the lame man leap like a deer and the tongue of the mute sing for joy. So after hearing these words, John's disciples leave. And I can only imagine the comfort that John feels after hearing about what has happened. I'm sure his mind would have been drawn to this passage from Isaiah's writings, and he would have found particular comfort in the words, be strong, fear not. Behold, your God will come with vengeance. With the recompense of God, he will come and save you. Church, how many of us are feeling anxious this morning? Are there any of us questioning our circumstances or wondering whether or not God is in control? I know I have those thoughts from time to time. In our passage today, we see an example that Jesus provides of what to do when faced with these situations. Essentially, he says, look to me and trust. Jesus offers us the opportunity to cast our anxiety on him because he cares for us. And then, as a miraculous exchange, he offers us the opportunity to take on his yoke and find rest for our souls. For his yoke is easy and his burden is light. 
Now, at the same time, realistically, I can imagine that John was also wrestling with other emotions as he was in his circumstances in this prison. His mind may have also went to a similar passage from Isaiah 61, which talks about good news being brought to the poor. However, that passage goes on to say to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to those who are bound. So I'm sure John was wondering, isn't Jesus going to manifest this passage in my life? I'm a captive. I'd like to be freed. This message could be perfectly fulfilled in me. But Jesus, in his divine wisdom and sovereignty, does not quote these words. It was not in his ultimate plan to release John from prison. Rather, rather than John being physically freed from prison, perhaps the greater salvation that John needed was for him to be reminded of who Jesus was as Messiah. So I think we're left with this situation where John is wrestling with his doubts, but he's also finding ultimate comfort in trusting in Jesus as the Messiah who was to come. And we too, when faced with doubts, can also cast our anxiety on Jesus and find our comfort in him. When we're faced with trials, perhaps like John, rather than being delivered from our physical circumstances, what we need even more is to be reminded that Jesus offers us ultimate spiritual deliverance. Now, at the end of Jesus' words here, he provides this special blessing to those who are not offended because of him. We might first find this interesting in wondering why Jesus included these words. He clearly thought it was important to include because he knew that his message would be offensive to, so, to some of those for whom it was intended. If we think about Jesus' words in Scripture, I'm sure we can all think of certain aspects that this world currently finds to be quite offensive. Things like, no one comes to the Father except through me. Or how is Jesus' message about absolute truth received in a relativistic society? Sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth, we read. As we navigate through life, the reality is that we cannot please everyone. If we're seeking to follow Jesus, the world will find our actions to be offensive at times. If we seek to go along with the world, we risk missing the opportunity to bring glory to the holy God of the universe. So the question then ultimately becomes, who would we rather displease? We can take heart in the blessing from Jesus to not be offended by who he is or his words. Continuing on now in the passage, if you'll turn with me, verses 24 through 28. When John's messengers had gone, Jesus began to speak to the crowds concerning John. What did you go out into the wilderness to see? A reed shaken by the wind? What then did you go out to see? A man dressed in soft clothing? Behold, those who are dressed in splendid clothing and live in luxury are in king's courts. What then did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes, I tell you, and more than a prophet. This is he of whom it is written, Behold, I will send my messenger before your face, who will prepare your way before you. I tell you, among those born of women, none is greater than John. Yet he who is least in the kingdom of God is greater than he. In this section, we see Jesus defending John's character. You see, there may have been some in the crowd who viewed John as weak for having doubts about whether or not Jesus was Messiah. However, Jesus clearly does not express this, nor is he condemning John. What does Jesus say about this man who the crowds flocked to the wilderness to see? There, of course, was great interest in John, as it had been 400 years since a prophet had arisen in Israel. Jesus affirms that John is not a weak man, not a reed shaken by the wind. John lived in the wilderness, eating locusts and wild honey. This does not sound like someone who is weak. Nor was he a man dressed in soft clothing or one who lived a royal's life of luxury. And just like in so many other passages in the scriptures, we see that God's methods of choosing leaders and using people to accomplish his work is very different from the world's way of doing this. For example, we can look to the story of when Samuel was sent to anoint the next king of Israel. 
Following God's lead, he went and looked at Jesse's sons. And after seeing Jesse's oldest son, Eliab, he thought it was this one who God would choose. Samuel was drawn to his impressive physical appearance and used this as the main criteria to identify a leader. But the Lord says to Samuel, do not look at his outward appearance, for the Lord sees not as man sees. Man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. One by one, starting with the oldest, Jesse presented his sons, and one by one, Samuel told Jesse that he was looking for someone else. Finally, Jesse presented his youngest son, David. And David, despite being the youngest son and not having that physical strength, was the one that God chose. You see, rather than choosing a leader based on how they look or their charismatic nature or one whose actions may be easily influenced, God looks at the heart. And there's a lesson for us too as we choose those who we will follow. Will we be consumed by outward appearances or will we focus on the heart? Getting back now to the text, Jesus then speaks about how the crowds flocked to the wilderness to see a prophet. And not only was John a prophet, but he was a special type of prophet, as he was the one who was also prophesied about. In verse 27, Jesus quotes Malachi 3 verse 1. There we read, Behold, I send my messenger, and he will prepare the way before me. And the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple, and the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight, behold, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. And after quoting this prophecy, which we believe to be about John, Jesus makes a remarkable claim. Among those born of women, he says, none is greater than John. Again, we see that rather than condemning John's actions, Jesus is making a very strong statement on John's character. And then Jesus makes an even more remarkable statement. He says, yet the one who is least in the kingdom of God is greater than he. What is Jesus meaning by this? I think if we're honest with ourselves, we can agree that John had a much greater influence than any of us in terms of God's overall plan of redemption. So certainly Jesus isn't meaning something like kingdom status here that we might think. What is he meaning? I suggest we think of, great, of greatness in terms of blessedness. It seems that Jesus is saying that even though none born of women is greater than John the Baptist, he who is least in the kingdom of God, so that's you and me, is in a greater state of blessedness than even John the Baptist enjoyed. You see, while John had an important role in proclaiming the coming Messiah, he was still on the outside looking in. Anyone born after the cross, after the resurrection, and particularly after the ascension of Christ, is living in a better situation in terms of the redemptive historical salvation than all the saints of the Old Testament. See, we get to look back on the death and resurrection of Jesus. We get to see how God's plan of redemption has been fully played out rather than looking to its foretelling in the Old Testament scriptures. Jesus has come and he's fulfilled his work and this is very good news. All the things that John looked forward to we get to see fulfilled. Now, let's read to see how the crowds respond to what they have witnessed. Turn with me to verses 29 through 35. There we read, When all the people heard this, and the tax collectors too, they declared God just, having been baptized with the baptism of John. But the Pharisees and the lawyers rejected the purpose of God for themselves, not having been baptized by him. To what then shall I compare the people of this generation? And what are they like? They are like children sitting in the marketplace and calling to one another, we played the flute for you and you did not dance. We sang a dirge and you did not weep. For John the Baptist has come eating no bread and drinking no wine. And you say, he has a demon. The son of man has come eating and drinking. And you say, look at him, a glutton and a drunkard a friend of tax collectors and sinners, yet wisdom is justified by all her children. In this passage, we see a clear distinction in the way that the tax collectors respond to Jesus' words compared to the Pharisees and lawyers. And I want us to really focus on this. On one hand, we read about the tax collectors who declared God just. But on the other hand, the Pharisees and the lawyers rejected the purpose of God for themselves. 
So what is God's purpose for our lives? What is it that these Pharisees and the lawyers were rejecting? In 1 Timothy, we read, this is good and it is pleasing in the sight of God our Savior who desires all people to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. It is God's desire that all should put their faith in him, ultimately for his glory. While both groups heard the exact same message, they responded very differently in witnessing Jesus's authority. And the sad thing in, the sad thing in this story is that it was those who thought they had no need of a savior outside of themselves, the religious elite. They were the one that refused this free gift. But as we saw earlier in today's passage, it was the blind and the lame and the sick and the poor and the ones that realized that they could not save themselves that followed Jesus. Those that realize they don't have it all together see Jesus as good news. But those who think they have no need of a savior are offended by the gospel. And we too, as with all people, are faced with this same choice of how to respond to Jesus's authority. You see, Jesus made some extraordinary claims about himself, didn't he? Like this one. He says, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. This is a bold statement from Jesus. He is very clearly claiming to be the one who offers salvation to the world. And he makes it clear that there is no other way by which we can be saved. Or there's another one where he says, truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. And by using these words, I am, those that heard him would have instantly recalled the story of Moses and the burning bush. In these two words, Jesus was claiming himself to be divine. He was declaring himself to be the eternal God of all creation, both fully human and fully God. And this crowd who looked to their family lineage for their right standing before God, had their entire worldview challenged. So when we're faced with reading about these claims that Jesus makes, we too must make a decision in how to respond. We can either decide that Jesus is lying or that he's crazy, or that these claims that he's making about himself are true. Whether we like it or not, every person on earth over the entire course of history is faced with this decision. Let that sink in for a minute. So if true, how do we respond? Do we respond in submission to the holy God, the one whom the entire scriptures ultimately point, the one who is tempted as we are yet without sin, the one in whom we have the forgiveness of sins through the riches of his grace which he lavished on us? This is not just a small amount of grace. This is the gospel message that we celebrate every week. We who were once aliens and foreigners were brought near through the blood of Christ. So now finishing with Jesus' closing words in this chapter, verses 31 to 35. To what then shall I compare the people of this generation? And what are they like? They are like children sitting in the marketplace and calling to one another, we played the flute for you and you did not dance. We sang a dirge and you did not weep. For John the Baptist has come eating no bread and drinking no wine, and you say, he has a demon. The Son of Man has come eating and drinking, and you say, look at him, a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. Yet wisdom is justified by all her children. In the closing words of this passage, Jesus compares the people of Israel to children. In Jesus' time, when the market was empty, children would often be found playing, and just like kids today, they would use their imagination to come up with games. But as you can imagine, while they were playing, the children wouldn't always agree on which game should be played. So they might start by saying, let's play a happy game and, and dance to the music of a flute. They might play this game for a while, but not long after, another child might say, no, 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 we don't want to play a happy game. We want to pretend to be at a funeral. We want to dance a solemn dance. So they might play a a funeral song, and one child might say, no, we don't want to play funeral. We don't want to mourn. Jesus is saying that those around him were acting very childish. They were fickle and and would complain. Nothing would satisfy them, and they were always finding fault. 
regardless of the messenger God sent to them, they were never pleased. So often, we want to mold Jesus into our own image. We demand God be whatever we want him to be, to do whatever we want him to do. We forget that he's in charge, that he's the king, he's sovereign, and he's no puppet for us to control. In this story, we see that on one hand, God first sent John. John lived in the wilderness, eating locusts and wild honey. He lived a simple life, secluded from the world. And what did the Jews say to him? He has a demon. So Jesus comes after him, and he was interested in having relationships with people. He shared meals with those around him, sometimes in the home of sinners. And in response to this, the Jews called him a glutton and a drunkard. In both situations, the Jews found fault. It seems they were not so much displeased by the messengers, but with God. I think there's an application for us here. Even as we gather on this Sunday morning, it can be so easy to become distracted by the things happening around us. You know, maybe the band is playing too loud or too quiet, or we would have preferred other song choices. I want to be clear in saying there's nothing wrong with personal preferences in many ways. Naturally, when we have so many people coming together from different backgrounds and demographics and stages of life, we're going to have differences of opinion. But my challenge this morning is that these things are all related to the messenger. Let us not become so distracted by these things that we fail to hear the message that God has for us. And let us critically ask ourselves, is our problem with the messenger or with a message from God? You see, we're all faced with reconciling the fact that we are sinful people in need of a savior. How are we going to respond to Jesus' authority over this world? Will the distractions of the messenger prevent us from facing the reality of the message? When we may be faced with difficult questions or circumstances in life, will we seek understanding through the studying of the scriptures and prayer, or will we just give up? And now, Jesus' closing words from the passage, verse 35, yet wisdom is justified by all her children. In his last words of the passage, Jesus provides this word about wisdom. To get a sense of what he is meaning, we first need to understand what he is meaning by justified in this context. So in this case, Jesus isn't using justified in the sense of the action of being made right before a just and holy God, but rather in the sense that it is shown to be a true claim. So what he is saying here is that wisdom is shown to be true wisdom by its fruits. We know whether a decision we make or an action we take is wise or not by observing its outcome. The Pharisees and the lawyers rejected both John and Jesus because in their opinion, these men's actions did not seem to be showing wisdom. Much of what they were observing in these two men did not align with their normal paradigm of what they expected. They thought that they were the wise ones and Jesus was foolish. But ultimately, looking at the example of Jesus, while they were present to observe the fruit of his actions, they failed to recognize this as true wisdom. They failed to submit to Jesus' authority and accept the free gift that was offered to them. So church, let us also submit to the one who is truly wise, to the one who claimed to have authority and who backed it up by his actions. Let us accept this salvation that is being offered to us by grace. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we do thank you for your word. And in your word, and especially in the book so far of Luke, we see you are one who has authority. And that presents a situation for us where we need to choose how to respond. And thankfully, we can respond by accepting the grace that has been offered to us in submission to the Holy God. Let us choose that this morning and always. Amen.